Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. I love it when we do these episodes where we reintroduce, we refresh the listeners' memories on these disappearances because we don't want, first of all, the stories to just fall in the bin of past stories that we've talked about. We always want to keep them relevant and also to prepare listeners for any developments that are coming up. But before we get to that, I want to prepare myself. I haven't yet done this for how you're doing. Hold on. Okay, I'm prepared. How are you today? Thank you for asking, Lance. I am doing well, and I'm excited to share this episode with our audience again. Calvin Johnny Hunt went missing on May 29th, 2018 from Cleveland, Tennessee, also known as 10 Mile, Tennessee, depending on the source. He's six foot, about 200 pounds, 38 years old, white male, and he was allegedly driving to meet his brother in Florida when he went missing. And we interviewed his brother, Brian, for this episode. And Lance, we also interviewed Brian again more recently, and that episode will be coming to the feed in just a week or so. And this episode was released the first time on September 30th, 2021, but there have been some developments, as uh, you will hear about in our upcoming episode with Calvin Johnny Hunt's brother, Brian, and Katrina, who is Kaya Taylor's sister. And so this is kind of a wild connection that we will introduce on our next episode. And we had mentioned that it's important to refresh the listeners' memories because we want them to be familiar with these stories for these developments. And over the past few weeks, it's come to our attention that these two cases are in fact related. And in that third episode that you mentioned, Tim, we're going to present that to the listeners. And I'm really excited to get the feedback on that the odds of how these cases are related and how it's all coming to us now. So stay tuned for that, folks. Yeah, it's very interesting and uh, a bit uh, bizarre, uh, to say the least. But um, if you have any information in Calvin Johnny Hunt's case, you can call the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation at 931-526-5041. And for those listening on the public feed, you're going to hear a couple of ads before we get into this episode. But, Tim, if people are listening to the subscription feed, they won't hear ads. Where can one go to discover episodes with no ads? Well, that's Missing Premium, Lance, and you can check that out at missing.supportingcast.fm. And for just $4.99 a month, you can get every single episode of Missing completely ad-free. You'll also get our weekly bonus show where we go into some of our personal opinions in the cases that we cover, and sometimes those opinions get fiery, Lance. And there's some fiery stuff going on on social media. If you follow us, <laughs> Tim, where can they follow us? Well, you can follow us on social media at Missing CSM. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. We really appreciate it. Welcome back to Missing. We're here today with Jennifer Amell. Jen, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you guys? We're doing pretty well today, Jen. And we wanted to thank you for bringing this document, this uh, case profile to us of Calvin Johnny Hunt. It's a very interesting case. Um, Quite bizarre at times as we get into the weeds of it. Um, This was another case that came into private investigations for the missing. And the research was conducted by our good friend and fellow researcher, Shana Walensky. Thank you very much, Shana. The document is great. And check out investigationsforthemissing.org to learn more about what's going on over at PIs for the Missing. Okay, so Calvin Johnny Hunt goes by Johnny Friar Tuck or Tuck. And he's been missing since May 29th, 2018. He's missing from 10 Mile, Tennessee. He was 38 years old when he went missing. He would be about 41 years old today. His height is about 6 feet to 6'1". His weight is 200 pounds, and he is a Caucasian man with brown hair and green eyes. Reportedly, he was last seen wearing a white polo shirt, tan or navy blue shorts, gray Nike or Adidas shoes, and a black fisherman's hat. 
He is said to have been last seen carrying a green bag and two small drone boxes. He is balding and typically shaves off his hair. He often wears hats or bandanas. He did wear a goatee at the time of his disappearance. He uses eyeglasses for reading. His left ear is pierced. Both arms have full tattoo sleeves. One forearm includes the anarchy symbol of an A inside of a circle, while the other includes a pentagram. And he has bones tattooed on the back of his hands and fingers. And Johnny grew up in Lakeland, Florida, with his mother, Shirley, and brother, Brian, who was older by eight years. And Jen, you actually spoke with Brian, right? I did. I had a couple of fantastic conversations with Brian. It's another example of a man who is just so committed to doing whatever he can to find his brother. It's caused a a lot of turmoil in his life. And you can, we'll hear from him a bit during this, this episode, but you can hear the pain apparent in his voice. And Johnny and Brian were adopted by their mother's husband, and Brian described Johnny as a shy kid, a nerdy kid, who was sometimes bullied. And when Johnny was eight and Brian was 16, they lost their adoptive father to suicide. And Brian says he wasn't really in his right mind after this tragedy, and he ended up moving to Arizona for a while. Johnny spent the rest of his childhood with his mother in Florida. And Johnny met and married a woman named Monica, with whom he had two sons. And when the marriage ended, Johnny found himself living with friends in Lake City, Florida. But by this time, older brother Brian was living in Georgia, a little closer. And Johnny told his brother he was unhappy with his current living situation, so Brian drove to Florida to pick him up to bring him to Georgia. Yeah, Brian says that after Johnny had been divorced for a couple years, um, he seemed kind of lost in life. Um, He didn't really know what to do next. Um, I know that he... Uh, kind of got involved in his brother's business. I think they um, were in the business of putting um, paint coats on vehicles. And so that was good for him. His brother gave him a little direction there. Um, but by the time he moved to to Georgia, he was ready for a fresh start. And I'm just curious how long the phone conversation was that you had with Brian. Which one? How many phone conversations did you, did you have? We have had two phone conversations, which have lasted a couple hours each, and then an interview that we recorded via Zoom. And we've been emailing a lot as well. So a lot of close contact with Brian. Yeah, yeah. He's a really open guy. And he's, you know, just trying to do his best. I mean, often it's like, you never expect something like this to happen to you. You know, you're not, you don't have any training, you don't know what moves to make. And fortunately, Uh, Private Investigations for the Missing is there as an organization to, of course, provide investigative services. But another thing we try to help out with is like, how do you keep this story in the media? Like, how do you organize a vigil? How do you raise money for such things? So that's been a lot of the context of our conversations together. And although they were separated during their youth, the brothers had become very close as adults. And Brian says drones were one of Johnny's favorite hobbies and that it was a hobby they both enjoyed. I get that. We love drones. And Johnny particularly liked using them to snap pictures of the sunrise and sunset. Whatever drone parts Johnny wasn't using, he would give to his brother to use. And Johnny even had a side business for drone repairs. And additionally, Johnny was a fan of the bands Guns N' Roses and Leonard Skinnerd. He loved fishing. That was one of his favorite hobbies. And one friend he had since middle school, who misses him dearly, wrote of the fond memories of Johnny teaching her how to fish. She says he wasn't perfect, but he was a special person who was always patient with her and accepting of her. Another friend of nearly 20 years wrote about how Johnny made sure to talk with him at least once a week to see how he was doing. Is that something that Brian had spoke to you about, Jen? Yeah, Johnny was a guy who cared deeply about the people close to him. He he didn't kind of like go off the grid and not communicate with the people he cared about. So, I mean, and this is evidenced by these people who kind of wrote in with their their memories of him. A lot of these posts uh, come from the family's Facebook page that Brian started um, just to uh, collect tips on the case. And uh, it's turned into a kind of a place where people have come to remember Johnny and and talk about what a what a cool Um, caring guy he was. And Brian says Johnny always had a very active dating life. And Johnny always had a girlfriend and one or two other women, quote, on standby, end quote. 
Typically, these were women he had met online. And Brian says this behavior began around the time of Johnny's divorce. He warned his brother that his sex life would lead to his downfall, but apparently it fell on deaf ears. I think Johnny was looking for affirmation in these various relationships. He seemed to be in a place where he he felt kind of unmoored for, from things that were familiar. I don't know if, uh, if Brian explicitly stated this, but he said enough to sort of suggest that Johnny potentially had some type of sex addiction. And Johnny's girlfriend at the time of his disappearance, Shannon Bryant Sneed, is another woman that he met online. She is from 10 Mile, Tennessee, and in early February of 2018, Johnny moved to Tennessee to be with Shannon. And they had only known each other for about a month and a half at that time. Once he moved, Johnny and Shannon would drive to visit Brian in Georgia regularly. Brian actually weighed in on his first impressions of Shannon in our interview earlier last week. Well, she seemed nice. I mean, you know, I didn't find, you know, really nothing wrong. I mean, I just thought, you know, that being so quick, you know, and that wasn't just only her, you know, and him too, you know, jumping, you know, that, you know, fast, you know, wanting to move in. And she seemed all right. I mean, she seemed straightforward, you know. I talked to her a couple of times, you know, here, you know, on the couch, you know, and she seemed, and, you know, she was straight up. She was, you know, I ain't going to play that cheating, you know. <laughs> You know, stuff like that. You know, I'm like, okay, well, I'm pretty serious about it. So she seemed fine to me. I mean, you know, nothing, you know, stood out like a psychopath or nothing like that. You know, she was like just normal, you know, normal person. I mean, you know, she seemed nice and laid back. And Brian says Johnny and Shannon did drugs together, typically weed and speed. Brian also says that Shannon's house had long been under suspicion for drugs by locals. Yeah, I think um, there's nothing substantiated about this. I'm, I'm not sure if if it was like a, a selling operation or if it was just like a house where people felt comfortable going to, to get high, you know, those <laughs> type of houses. Um, I don't think uh, Shannon's ever been convicted of, of anything drug related. So this is all rumor. And Brian spoke of problems in their relationship, namely Shannon stating that she wouldn't put up with Johnny's philandering behavior. And now we get into the circumstances of Johnny's disappearance. According to the police report that Brian Hunt filed, he spoke with Johnny on Tuesday, May 29th of 2018. Johnny and his girlfriend Shannon were en route to visit Brian in Georgia. The drive from 10 Mile, Tennessee to Lilburn, Georgia is about 186 miles and should have taken them approximately two hours and 45 minutes. But a little after 7 p.m., Shannon texted Brian and told him they would no longer be coming for dinner. Brian tried to contact Johnny, but could only get Shannon. Shannon told Brian that she and Johnny had gotten into a verbal altercation in the car, and she dropped him off at the Pilot Travel Center in Cleveland, Tennessee. Shannon dropped Johnny off on the highway, on an interstate, um, between two exits. In one direction, back the way they were coming, it was about two miles from the last exit and about a mile and a half to the next exit. And I think there was a pilot travel center along that route that Johnny could have potentially walked to. I mean, that would have been in my mind if I was walking alongside the highway to, to try to get to a place like that. But he was not seen there. So where did the story get uh, get mistaken then that, that he actually was dropped off at this pilot station? Um, I think it came from potentially a confusion of conversation with Brian um, when he talked to newspapers or or media and said that he had actually searched the pilot and asked questions of the people who worked there if they had seen Johnny. I think additionally, the police were checking for any CCTV of, uh, of Johnny going there at some point, but nothing was found of his presence at this pilot travel center. And geographically, Cleveland, Tennessee is about 46 miles from Johnny and Shannon's home and likely should have taken less than an hour to drive. Shannon stated Johnny asked to be let out. And since he is a grown man, she left and, quote, never looked back. Brian also says Shannon told him that Johnny got mad and broke his phone, which is why no one could get a hold of him. Brian told police that it is unlike Johnny to not be in contact with him as they typically speak daily. And police checked local hospitals and arrest records, but found nothing. Now, from what you've told us, Jen, based on your conversations and your interview with Brian, he's done pretty much all he can, and he's still working on it, trying to figure out what happened to Johnny the day he went missing. Yeah, in in Brian's words, uh, I think the police got a lot of their information 
from the things that Brian was able to uncover himself. So it's, I mean, there's a few things that Brian wouldn't have access to, like phone pings and things like that. But any kind of communication that Johnny had with people after he got out of his girlfriend's car was uh, due to some sleuthing on Brian's part to try to recover his computer and his phone. Um, so yeah, he's he's gone all over the place, actually traveling around the area, going to various motels, hotels, asking people if they've seen Johnny. Um, unfortunately, to no avail. Okay, let's go over some of these details then. Shannon and Johnny had some people over to their house earlier on the day that Johnny disappeared to work on Johnny's new motorcycle. And a man named Brian Wentworth was there until about 2 p.m. that day, but uh, apparently police have never talked to him. What's that all about? Yeah, we can't really say for sure that this person was there on the day that Johnny disappeared. They they weren't able to say, like, you know, establish a, a firm timeline here. They think potentially that this guy, Brian Wentworth, might have been mistaken on the day that he came over or Shannon might be mistaken on when their friends came over to work on the motorcycle. Not sure if this has any relevance to the case either. I mean, of course, it's it's important to to find out what exactly Johnny's movements were that day, especially if we kind of take this story that they did get in the car and were driving toward Georgia. Like, what if that never even happened and Johnny never left his house? I think that's where it would be important if people were over his house that day. Yeah, and I think his state of mind, too. I think, uh, you know, if they knew they were going to drive about three hours a little later, maybe that would have been heard of. Or, you know, if they were arguing or if he was, uh, you know, Johnny might have been um, not making sense, perhaps, that day. And there was another person other than Shannon to have seen Johnny that day. And that was a man named Travis Pritchett. And he was helping with the motorcycle as well. And Travis stated that he last saw Johnny at about 4.45 p.m., that day and he and Johnny left the garage and walked about 150 feet back to the house where Shannon who was angry was waiting on the back porch that's when Travis took off on his own motorcycle and left them yeah i i had asked Brian what this argument like if Travis weighed in on what the argument was about but we don't really have any more information there well so we know that they got into an argument if they were driving in their car and that's what led to Johnny getting out of the car and walking off on his own. Um, it seems from Travis's statement that they were angry much before that too. So this might've been an, a sort of ongoing argument that escalated later. And then the text messages begin. At about 5.30 p.m., the brothers texted about their evening plans. Johnny and Shannon were headed to Brian's for dinner, again, about a three-hour drive. But some of these texts are a little confusing to Brian, and Brian is not really certain this is Johnny texting. Yeah, this is uh, where the case gets super bizarre because the only documentation we have of everything is via these text messages. There were no calls placed, so you can't really ascertain if it was like Johnny's voice on the other end. It was just just texts. So there's something about the order of events and the wording and tone that Johnny was using in these text messages that sort of pointed to Brian that it wasn't actually his brother communicating with him. Now, going over all of these texts might get a little convoluted and confusing. Reading it is pretty confusing, uh, not knowing the circumstances or the types of people that they were only seeing it on paper is one thing, but experiencing it on your own phone when it's your brother and your brother's girlfriend is another thing. But on our document, we start off with Johnny's text to Brian, and he's saying he's sitting in the car debating and then sitting in the car debating whether or not to run. And he actually, I don't know if this means anything, but he misspelled weather, not the W-H. He spelled it as W-E-A-T-H-E-R, uh, whether or not to run. And Brian questions that. Uh, and he says, run away from you. Better figure out that one very soon because your brother's been having bad feelings about her. And I'm just saying, so anyway, where are you sitting in the car at home? So there's no punctuation in here. It's, it's kind of tough to decipher where the uh, inflection should be and the pauses should be. But essentially the gist is, are you talking about running away? I have bad feelings about her and where are you? 
Right. Mm-hmm. And apparently they, I mean, they should have been in the car together, I guess, at this point, traveling towards Brian. And so then Johnny writes, on my way to you. And then right after it's follow up or there. So or there and, and there being spelled T-H-E-R-E. So he's indicating where or maybe maybe he misspelled there for another there. Is he saying like if he runs away, that's where he'll end up there? I'm going to you or there or I'm running right. away. Gotcha. Yeah, it, it's it is confusing. I did have a point to clarify with um with Brian. I asked him if Johnny was usually the one to drive the vehicle and if he was driving i know people text and drive but it it was a long series of of texts after this um but he said that usually his girlfriend shannon would drive and that uh johnny was in the passenger seat and according to shannon johnny fell asleep and she tried to wake him up at one point and he just kind of turned over and handed her his phone and that's how she explains that she had johnny's phone and she had been running through it and saw some kind of lewd text messages he had been sending a girl that he was trying to see i think someone he met online and that's what started the argument i think um brian's very skeptical of this order of events because he doesn't think his brother like knowing his brother and knowing that he probably did have girls on the side would never willingly give his phone to to shannon like because he didn't want to risk being you know caught in that way yeah and the next text brian received from johnny is kind of strange too and it's quote i've been lying and cheating on shannon all this time and asked to marry me Shannon thinks she knows, but I convince her she's crazy, end quote. Yeah, it's like, who would admit to gaslighting their partner? Just strange. Yeah, it is, um, especially to to the his brother. And then, you know, he gives Shannon the phone. I it Something about that is, is very bizarre as well to me. Mm-hmm. It almost seems confessional, you know. Mm-hmm. But without any context. So I'm sh- if it was Shannon with the phone, maybe she just like wanted to kind of blow up Johnny's life and like let everybody know like what a liar and a cheater he was, you know, if she was scorned in that way. Right. That's why I think it's interesting, you know, to talk to the last people who had seen him. Right. I mean, let's find his state of mind. Maybe he was talking to them about these confessions, too, for all we know. Mm hmm. These text messages are still within that 545, 6 o'clock time frame during the drive? Yes. These all happened during the drive. And is there any example of Johnny doing this previously? Like, is this how Johnny would typically talk or text with his brother? You know, Brian explicitly stated that this is not how Johnny would text. Um, And he does not think that his brother sent this text. Interesting. Yeah. You know, he's either napping or he's uh, confessing in in this uh, car ride. It's very, very strange. Yeah. And it gets weirder, too. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And Brian has supplied us with screen caps of texts from Shannon regarding what happened that night. Yeah. So at this point, it seems that Shannon admits to having Johnny's phone. Um, Like, this is Shannon speaking, blah, 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 blah. This is what's happening. But doesn't do that when she or he sent the lying, cheating text. So we know for a fact that at some point Shannon had his phone, um, but we don't know when exactly it was her who started texting. Well, it would have had to have been before Johnny broke the phone. Well, apparently Johnny had two or three phones, and it's unclear which phone she was using and which phone Johnny supposedly destroyed. Yeah, so I think during the course of their argument, and this is coming from Shannon, during their argument, Johnny had snatched back his phone, and because he was so angry, he broke the phone on the dash, like kind of slammed it against the dash. Brian sort of weighed in on this behavior, and he was like, you know, Johnny had... a." a you know, a temper like anyone else, like he, if he was pushed, he, he wasn't a violent man at all, but he said that Shannon was actually the one who had the, the violent temper. Um, she had 
actually broken more than one phone. So it's it's possible that Shannon is the one who actually broke the phone. You might not know this. Brian might not have said anything about this, but I have two questions. What kind of phone was it? And where is that phone now? The broken one. I think um, the police had one phone in their custody. I'm not sure if it was the broken one. And I know that Brian himself had recovered another phone of Johnny's, but didn't find anything of interest on it. It's, it's pretty impressive how hard you have to slam a phone to break it on a dash when you're that close. For sure. So we can probably go through some summaries of these text screen caps from Shannon. So Shannon was texting as herself the night Johnny disappeared from his phone to a mutual friend saying that she is, quote, scared that he, Johnny, is planning something, end quote. Yeah, we never really know what she is alluding to here. Planning what? To run away? Yeah, was it to run away or was it to go see another girl? Was it, you know, we have no idea. But then Shannon forwards a very sexually explicit text that she found on Johnny's phone from a woman named Erica. And then Shannon says that Johnny is, quote, passed out cold, end quote. She tried to wake him and he rolled over and gave her his phone. And this is all to the mutual friend that she's sending these text messages from Johnny's phone, just to be clear. I really don't know. I, this is either to the mutual friend or to Brian, who's waiting on them. But it's all from Johnny's phone, mm -hmm. and Shannon has, has identified herself. Yeah. Okay. And she goes on to say, I don't have anybody to help me. And then she proceeds to say Johnny raped her. If that's true, I mean, that's awful, and probably speaks to her state of mind, too. Like, if that did happen, she would want to get back at him. I assume. But if it's not true and she's just trying to poison the well with his friends and family, um, that's a pretty, pretty awful thing to say about somebody. And then Shannon says that she is hiding in the woods because she doesn't know what to do. There's a very, very strange one. Again, back to that state of mind. Yeah, this I mean, this whole period of time where Shannon is texting makes absolutely no sense to me. And I don't think it makes sense to Brian either. Like either they're driving down the road and he's sleeping and she's texting or they're stopped somewhere. She never said that they stopped somewhere. What woods is she in? And why is she scared of Johnny? Like what's going on? Or did this happen after Johnny got out of the car? I mean, none of it makes sense. None of it lines up. And she continues to say these are quotes. He is sleeping, quote, been up for many days. And that's unclear whether she means herself or Johnny or both. She is shaking because she doesn't know what's going to happen. And all of these text messages is Shannon allegedly texting the aforementioned mutual friend from Johnny's phone. Yes. According to the document, that's all going to the mutual friend. Okay. And Brian texts with Shannon, trying to understand what happened to Johnny. Shannon responds with, quote, I don't want my kids seeing this, end quote, and doesn't elaborate when Brian asks her what exactly it is that she doesn't want her kids to see. Shannon asks Brian, quote, what about Johnny's apartment, end quote, and doesn't elaborate when Brian asks her about the apartment. Brian apparently did not know anything about Johnny having an apartment. Yeah, so I think... Um... Shannon had said that potentially Johnny was planning to leave her and he got an apartment or got a place to live um, and was planning to to go stay there. I think that's what Shannon's alluding to. But it's weird that she doesn't give any context for this because Brian had no idea like his brother was planning to leave or if he was getting a new apartment, which is just weird. The whole situation is weird. There's no evidence that he was signing a lease anywhere or had been looking anywhere or put a down payment, a deposit or anything on an apartment. Not that I know of. And then Shannon asks Brian, why would he ask to marry and then do this? Shannon says Johnny handed over his phone and showed her how to open it. And Johnny made her pull over and said he was going to walk or catch a ride. After Shannon sends all these texts to Brian... Why would he do this to me? He wants to marry me. He's going to leave me. You know, what about the apartment? All this stuff. I think then they get into the huge argument where Johnny leaves the car. And after this point, I think Brian has been able to 
recover some things from Johnny's phone that he had placed a call to this woman named Sheila, who he was planning a hookup with that night. Okay, and and that was on a different phone than Shannon was texting with? A different one of Johnny's phones? I think so. Yeah, it's 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 hard to to keep it all straight. I feel like that would make more sense um, if he's, you know, he gave Shannon one of his phones, not the one with um, a bunch of evidence of his philandering behavior. You know, I mean, I don't know why you'd have more than one phone anyway, unless you're doing something that you don't want someone to know about, like whether that's drugs, which they apparently were into a little bit, at least, um, or something like this. But then, like, what's the impetus for this, like, huge blowout argument in the car, right? Like, according to Shannon, it was that she found some lewd text message on his phone, and that's what, you know, started them fighting, and that's why he got out of the car. While driving, I mean, some, it's just some of this is is uh, is very confusing. We've got really two different stories here. You got the paper trail, and then mm-hmm. you've got uh, Shannon's story, which uh, he was napping and then apparently confessing. Mm-hmm. Well, you also have Travis's story, which is she was mad right before I left them, right before they were supposed to go visit Brian. So perhaps the I think we mentioned this before that she had made this discovery prior to the trip and then the argument just carried on into the car. Yeah, I think that's that's what Shannon was alluding to. It's like even though they were fighting, they had agreed to go to Georgia to go have dinner with uh, with Brian. Is there a record of when and where these text messages were pinged? Like if they were on the way to Georgia, couldn't we just sort of follow the trail of towers as as they're getting closer to Brian? Yeah. I think um not sure not sure if that was done but there was a last ping on Johnny's phone which we will get into and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program and so Shannon goes on the quote is he never planned to come back with me and I'm just heartbroken he hasn't even called or nothing she goes on, I couldn't help it. He's been lying to me the whole time and mind effing me. She spelt the real word. He asked me to marry him just the other trip there. I've been used and just couldn't keep quiet because of the pain he's inflicted on me. And apparently this is where those text messages end or there's nothing further about Johnny and him disappearing. Yeah, I also don't know if Shannon actually said explicitly that she let Johnny off on the side of the road that night. I think it was the day a day later when Brian had not heard from Johnny that he called Shannon and he was like, hey, where's my brother? And she was like, oh, I let him off on the side of the road. But he never, like she never told him that was going on. And Johnny, of course, never texted or called his brother to say like, hey, I won't make it or please come pick me up. I'm stranded, you know. And there were some texts from Shannon to Brian that were sent in the days following Johnny's disappearance. And Shannon asks Brian if it's okay if she spreads around a flyer about how Johnny has gone missing. And Shannon says, I hope this helps. Believe it or not, I do love Johnny and you guys. I just can't grasp that he's missing. Call it wishful thinking, but I'd rather believe the stories I've heard about his plan on taking a mini vacation from me. Ellipsis, quote. Basically, the overall theme of Shannon right now is that her story is that she she got Johnny in the car. They got into an argument. He left on the side of the road and then she's laying it on uh, pretty thick to to Johnny's family that she's like so worried about him that he's missing. She can't believe it um, and that she's doing all she can to to help find him. But she chooses to believe that you know, he had he had just like wanted to leave her and so did did it in a bizarre way by walking away from her. The most helpful information Brian does manage to get from Shannon is that she let Johnny out on I-75 South past the exit for Cleveland and near the exit for Udawa between a small rest area and the exit. She says he had his phone. He grabbed, quote, the money bag, end quote, and his drone boxes. Shannon took the Udawa exit and took the back way home. Very strange. Okay, so then this is the first mention we've got of the money bag, uh, quote unquote. 
I don't know if it was actually a bag full of money. I've heard it described as a green bag too. So maybe she just called it the money bag because it was green. Okay. It was like a green bag that had money on it or in it. Maybe? I don't think, I don't even know if not there even was money in it. necessarily. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. So let's get into the investigation now. The rest area has been checked for video footage. Um, and I assume no sign of Johnny because they likely would have put that out there. And Johnny's phone was tracked to a house in the woods, a back road out near the Cleveland exit, Highway 61, which actually does track with uh, part of Shannon's story. Yeah, that he was out in that direction. I don't know if the whole traveling down the highway thing is necessarily supported by any kind of evidence, but it's this is the only place in the story where this house in the wood appears. Um, I know the police had gone out to that residence to check it out, but there was no sign of Johnny there either. It was just the last place where his phone was pinged. And then apparently someone was erasing files on Johnny's laptop at 1.15 a.m. on May 30th, which is the day after he went missing, but really that same night. Yeah, it would have been the same night. And Johnny's laptop was still at Shannon's residence where they lived together. It was not with him. And I'm assuming that the laptop is with law enforcement, right? I think it's actually with Brian now. He was the one who discovered that some files had been cleared at that time. So logically, Johnny would have walked to the Udawa exit because the Cleveland exit was two miles away and he was closer to that one. Yeah. And there was a Waffle House, a convenience store, and two motels that Brian has already canvassed to see if they had seen Johnny. Yeah, and nobody has. He hasn't been able to get any other sighting of him in that area. And the police pulled Johnny's phone records, and apparently someone either turned off the phone at 11.54 p.m. on May 29th, or the phone died itself at that time. This is news to me. I didn't realize that you can tell whether a phone was turned off or died based on a phone record. Um, I don't think you can, actually. Oh. I think it was just that the phone ceased to ping after that point. So it was either turned off or dead. Gotcha. Okay. And Johnny called four people after getting dropped off. Yeah, and this is on the side of the highway. So after Brian managed to collect one of Johnny's phones, allegedly the one that he must have had when he was walking down the street, which I have no idea how he would have gotten gotten his hands on because like wouldn't that phone be with wherever johnny disappeared to or maybe it was just records that they were able to get through other means like through the um carrier but apparently he he called four different people as he was walking alongside the highway but never actually mentioned that he was abandoned on the side of the highway now, he also, it seems, texted another person named Shannon who lives in Florida, and the 30-minute texting back and forth, there was no mention that he was on the side of the road, and this other Shannon got the feeling that it wasn't Johnny who was texting her. Yeah, I mean, that's the second person who was like, eh, I'm not really sure if this is the person I, I think it is, which should go a long way. I feel like, I feel like you know how people sound in text messages, you know? Or they're saying things that are kind of like outside the purview of the relationship you have with that person. You know, I feel like I feel like those those feelings are important in this case. And Johnny apparently texted his ex-wife, Monica, who is in California at 845 p.m. I love you. Just vaguely. I love you. And there was another girl in Florida where he texted, hey, could you come get me? And another message to an individual named Brian Lampler, it ended up being a wrong number, obviously, because it was some sort of a hookup call. Yeah, so Johnny is allegedly texting all of these women. It's like, uh, I mean, to his ex-wife, it was not sexual in nature, I don't think. But the other women, he was, you know, trying to to get them to sleep with him that night, which just seems like an odd thing to do if you're walking along the side of the highway. To me, my first action would be like, who do I know who lives closest and wouldn't mind coming to get me at this point? Those That would be the nature of my calls and texts, not like trying to hook up with somebody. But It could be a little column A, column B there. You know, if he needs a place to stay, no matter what, might as well stay with a, a friend uh, you're attracted to, maybe. 
And Shannon gave many different stories. One of them, some guy with a motorcycle in the back of a pickup truck picked up Johnny from their house. Yeah, so this is like a totally different story. In in this version, she and Johnny never actually got on the road to go to Georgia. Um, she says that he was still at their house in Tennessee when this stranger with a motorcycle in the back of his truck picked up Johnny, and that's where he disappeared. So Okay, not one of the two people who were at the house earlier who were working on the motorcycle. This is a, a now a third person, apparently. Right. And another story that Shannon gave was that Johnny was in a motel room because he needed a break, uh, and she hoped to hear from him the following Monday. Don't understand why he'd have a motel room if he also has an apartment. I want to bring this up that Shannon has two kids, 15 and 8, and after Johnny disappeared, the kids have developed some serious issues. That's correct? Yeah, I think Brian had talked about some emotional issues that the kids have been having at school and elsewhere. He didn't really elaborate on this, but I'm not a psychologist, but often if there's a tra traumatic event in kids' lives, it can lead to emotional issues in other areas that you wouldn't necessarily think are, co are connected. But it is interesting to note that they had a change in behavior right after this. So what happened to Johnny? Brian feels it's unlikely that Johnny would have left on his own. He was very close with his brother and never went long without talking with him. And Brian believes his brother is deceased. Brian has been doing all he can to get attention on his brother's case. He says his life has fallen apart since Johnny went missing. He blames himself for not protecting his younger brother. Brian wants to be able to find Johnny and give closure to their mom and to Johnny's two sons, who are now 19 and 20 years old. And Johnny's friend Angela has contacted us to tell us how much he meant to her and to tell us how heartbroken she is that he still has not been found. She misses him every day and refuses to speak of him in the past tense until she knows for certain that he is no longer with us. I asked Brian kind of what his emotional state is right now, and he said something like, really poignant to me that I think um, maybe is a sentiment shared by other families of missing people. But he said, sometimes I think people lose themselves um, when trying to picture all the different scenarios that might have happened to their loved one. It's like this, this concept of losing yourself as you're looking for a missing person is interesting. Like you get lost along with them in some way. I think that was a really interesting way of putting what it feels like to to go through something like this on top of you know not knowing what happened where he is you know it's kind of like you're a shut off it's kind of like the news don't care no one cares i don't know how much sleep like very little sleep i got for months and months and months just i had my head buried into a computer and a phone going at the same time you know uh, background searches and i mean you know pay for all that you know i mean i any name i could get you know i searched i checked the record it consumes you. I feel like a zombie half the time. I'm not here, but it's kind of like, I don't enjoy anything anymore. I don't, you know. It definitely changes your life. That's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, there's so many things that just beat the family down during a during a situation like this. That it's great. Everything seems to just get you, you know. It's like no one's here to help you, you know. Like dreams and those are bad, you know. And Johnny's family has set up a GoFundMe. You can find it by searching Justice for Johnny on GoFundMe or use the link in the show notes. And if you've got any information on Calvin Johnny Hunt's disappearance, please contact the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation at 931-526-5041.